Hi, everyone. Fascinating discussion today talking about the intersection of Gen AI with creativity and design and so much more with the CEO, founder of FreePick. Joaquin, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Evan. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, really uh, intrigued by your journey and the, the mission at FreePick. Let's go back to the beginning. What was the big idea behind FreePick? And um, you've been at this for 15 years. That's quite a journey. What was the original vision? Yeah, it's making me old. Like uh, we started in 2010, at the end of 2010, beginning 2011. And the main idea was we were scratching our own itch, as you say. So we were making websites. And at the time, the bottleneck for us to make a great website was to get uh, great images. It was a slow process, okay? Uh, we were all the time on the internet, like chasing for great images. And we said, hey, why don't we make it faster so that we can just make you know better websites? Uh, and we did a little search engine for free images. Uh, we call it pre big very naturally, okay? Uh, so you can think of it as a, originally as a kind of a Google for free images. Okay, it was in some vertical. And we moved from there. Like we have been iterated since we launched it, like looking at what will make our product better for our users, like understanding that our core mission was to help people get make great designs faster. Okay, so that, that was our motto. Let's help them make something great faster. Um, we look at the main pain points, we added diagrams, we added photos. Um, and we created our own content and something we shut down the, the search engine. And of course, two years ago, we got Gen AI and we saw that we can completely change the approach. We can, we could like reach something that was way more generic than the, the product that we had until then. Um, we could make the images that the users needed very specifically, very, very bespoke images. So we started on the journey of Gen AI images two years ago. And it's been a wild ride since then. And you have quite an amazing, uh, you know, value proposition here, and and the site looks incredible. Um, you know, maybe describe AI, the role of AI now. It's pretty central to many of your products. How do you see AI re redefining, reinventing the creative process? Sure. Listen, at its core, like the the first models that we got where something, a little machine, you know, where you input some text and you get a, a little image in output. Okay, fair enough. So we say, okay, this is a little bit simple and, and people out there, people, especially professionals, they have, they need more robust workflows. Okay, they need sometimes, they get an image, but it's not quite there, that, that happens quite often. Uh, very often the image that you get is 70% there, but it has glitches, it has things that you need to fix. Uh, what people did at the time was to download the image, to go to another software like Photoshop, you know, change it, tune it, maybe go to Lightroom, fix the colors, and, and then ship it, okay? And we said, okay, can we just make this last mile edition kind of integrated in the generation? Can we make something that helps you generate an image and then retouch it, upscale it? That was a huge problem with no, no good solution. Uh, maybe changing the aspect ratio, like all the things that the professional user need. Can, can we put it all in a single product? Okay. So at the end of the day, we don't have any more like one single model that we use. We have under the hood like 20 different models. I like to think of it like a computer. Okay? Inside the computer, you have many different microchips. Okay, you have a CPU and you have memory and you have the hard drive and you have the GPU, uh, you know, many different things. And you need to put them all together to make a product, to make something that people can use and like it or not, you know, and, and they buy the best computer at the end of the day. They don't buy the best model. They buy the best workflow. They buy the best product. And that's what we are doing. Fantastic. And you have a kind of freemium model that serves both entry-level users, enthusiasts, as well as professional designers, how do you cater to such a diverse audience? Listen, uh, freemium, it's, it's on our ethos. Like we started as something that was created also to make the great design more affordable to people. Uh, so it's, it's kind of our, on our DNA, okay? So since the very beginning, 
we have always had a very strong premium proposition. It's not something that is uh, a small thing to attract people. It's, it's something really that they can stand on its own. Uh, but of course, the big difference between AI models, AI product, and a stock product is that there is a marginal cost to create a new image. Okay, there's a very solid cost to do AI. So the premium product on the AI suite, I have to confess, is, is like lower, it's less generous than on the stock side because it's just impossible to make it with, with an acceptable margin. Uh, but it's still nevertheless very approachable. It's something that we want to make very affordable. If you compare Freebig, even the paid product, you compare it to our peers, we are usually by far like the cheapest in the market. And it's not because we want to be cheap, but because it's on our DNA to make it accessible. We really want to, uh, to make it accessible to everybody. And we also believe philosophically that when you make something 10 times cheaper, you get a different use case. Okay, the difference is not quantitative, it becomes qualitative. It enables new use cases that were not available before. And very often those use cases, they are like an order of magnitude bigger. So even though you have a lower margin, uh, if you price it very low, you usually end up making more money at the end of the day. Yeah, it's a great uh, commercial approach. So you have on your website tools like Sketch to Image, AI video generation, background remover, on and on. What are some of the features that have gotten the most uh, buzz and, and feedback from customers? Oh, as you mentioned, it, video is a huge one. Our upscaler is a huge one. Um, on video, you can go now like all the way to the final product, like end to end. Yeah. We even have an online video editor where you can stitch together multiple clips, add text, add uh, static images. Uh, so this one is phenomenal. Under the hood, it has access to all the latest models. So you have access to, to Clean, to VO2, Runway, Luma Labs, like all of them. Uh, so that requires some expertise on the part of the user because very often it's not trivial to know what is the best model for what they want to do. And that's something that we need to improve. We want to make it uh, even easier for users so that if you don't know exactly what model to pick up, we make a decent uh, default choice for whatever you want to make. Um, so video is going very, very high. Uh, the audio one is picking up steam lately. So we have a product that helps you make voiceover, helps, helps you make sound effects. So you, you integrate video with sound effects, lip sync, and you have everything that you need to make great commercials. Okay, so that's a vertical use case that we are doing that is working very, very well. And of course, the image generation side is huge at Ruby. That's, that's our traditional core expertise, and it's, it's the biggest one that we have. So by image generation, we have, again, under the hood, like multiple models to generate image. We have our own model, which is Mystic, that delivers top-notch quality images. Then you have uh, image, image in three from Google. You have Flux, Flux uh, 1.0, 1.1, FluxDev. You have many different visual styles that have been created by our team. So each one of them has been hand-curated. And we generated what is called a LoRa, which is kind of a specialization of a model. So it delivers exactly the visual style that uh, you are looking at. Um, so in general, image generation will be first, video generation will be second. Fascinating. <clears throat> and you have, obviously, to navigate very difficult ethical uh, considerations, copyright issues, uh, that, that must take a lot of your time and, and effort to, uh, to work through. Absolutely. So we took uh, a lot of time to get comfortable with the legality of the models. So we run multiple consultations to check the law in, in Europe and in the US. Um, so I'm going to talk about the one that I'm more familiar with, which is the law in Europe. And it is very often the most restrictive uh, set of laws. So very often, if you are good in Europe, you are good worldwide. Okay. So how, we, how it works in Europe is that you can use a piece of, you can use an asset uh, to train a model if the author of the asset uh, has not withdraw the rights to use it to train models. So it's an opt-out model, okay? So by default in Europe, you can use any image where the author has not opposed, 
free shoes. Okay, to make it uh, to make it work in Europe, it's mandatory, and that's very recent. When you create a model, it's mandatory to list uh, what are the what are the, the copyright holders of the images that you are using, so that they have an opportunity to oppose. Okay, but in general, all the models that we use, they have withdraw all the images from all the stock sites. And there was a project that was created so that artists can oppose to the usage of their images to train AI models. And uh, I think the number of images that it has where people have opposed is like 1 billion. Okay? So none yeah. of those images have been used in any of the models that we host. Okay? Uh, and now there are some models that take it one step below, uh, one step beyond that. Okay? So we have some models that uh, are compliant with that law. Uh, for example, Flux, okay, they are not using any image that has a post, so it's clean. But then there are some models that take it one step beyond. I'm talking about Google Image Entry. They use a, a slightly more restrictive policy, which is they only use images that they have li licensed themselves, okay? And that's also true for the model that we have developed. We only use images that we have licensed to use, okay? So the modeling by Google uh, what they did is they they paid the author of the images. In this case, uh, there are like multiple data sets that you can license to train those models. And ourselves, we have uh, many images that we have licensed and that we can use to train our model. So that has been our philosophy. Fantastic. And this space remains so dynamic and competitive. Every day there's a new model, a new announcement, open source versus you know the big tech giants. How do you how do you stay ahead of of this uh, wave? Uh, you know how do you manage to uh, leverage best of breed technology and but uh, stay ahead of the competitors? What's your philosophy there? Well, for the most part, we try to be in a position where we benefit from those uh, tailwinds, mm -hmm. so to say. Okay, so we are uh, as I mentioned, we are building the bridge between models. We are building. All the all the scaffolding, all the infrastructure that people need to use the models. Like when you generate images, you need to be able to search past images easily. You need a place where you are storing them. You need to be able to share it to share them with your colleagues. You know, there, there is a lot involved into working with images, not just the, the pure generation. And that's where expertise is. Now, concerning the models, uh, we have best in class, state of the art, and when there's a new model, we usually integrate it in ours. Uh, so we are very, very fast to integrate the latest and best. Um, and we're in a position where now, when there's a new model popping up, it actually reduces the number of bugs that people have with our, with our product. Like when you look at uh, complaints from people, the number one is, hey, I'm trying to do this, I'm explaining it clearly, but it's not picking it up. Okay, that happens quite often. So every time there's a new model, the percentage of errors just goes down. So we 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 have happier customers when there are new models popping up. Yeah, really well said. Um, what are your customers asking for next? Uh, you have so many designers, enthusiasts. Uh, what what are they What are they asking for in terms of you know new features, new functionality, new services? Uh, at the moment? Listen, uh, the the answer here is that it depends on the customer. Like we, mm -hmm. we came from having a very core customer that was the graphic designer, the marketer. Now with AI, the truth is that this has expanded to multiple expertise. We have people working on filmmaking. We have photographers. Uh, we have like different kind of professionals now. Yeah, and each one of them has a different pet peeve. Like one thing that is common to many of them is, uh, you mentioned it before, like legally, uh, we want something that we can purchase at our company. So they want, they want insurance and they want like the legal certainty that they can use the models that they have. So something that we have introduced, we are launching an enterprise subscription where admins can shoot down models that they are not comfortable with. Okay, Even though again, like we have checked all of them and according to our lawyers, like all of them are legal to use, but different companies may have different opinions and we respect that. So that's one concern, like being more friendly to, to corporates. Another one is working in teams. So we launch projects, we launch sharing 
of projects. And then it's like, there have been lots of different ways uh, and, and, and an incredible amount of, of experimentation in the user interface on how you create images. So we started with, uh, I will say a relatively uh, trivial, it was not trivial, but kind of trivial image generator. And now we are moving into experimenting, okay, how about having an assistant? Because now we have so many tools, but can, can we have a central way to ask the machine for what they want? and see how it uses the tools that it needs to pull it up together. Um, can we enable now automatic workflows? Can we help the users? And now you have a place where you say, hey, I wanna make this kind of image. And maybe to make the particular image that you want, it's like combining six different steps and, and it makes it you know, by itself encapsulated in a single workflow. And now we are experimenting also we having uh, a visual representation of your workflow that is great to work with group of images. So sometimes you want to cluster images and you want to say, okay, I want, I want to generate an image in the style of this cluster here. And I want to use the object that is in this other cluster here. And I want to do, or I want to take this cluster and want to upscale it. You know, there, so there are many things like that where with the traditional UI, it will require many dynamic uh, on-the-fly clustering. And there is usually no record of what was the selection that you made. So you pick like 10 different images, you do your operation and the selection is gone, okay? And sometimes you need to do like multiple operations with those selections. So we are experimenting with new user interfaces to make it easier to work with uh, groups of images. So there, there is, I mean, it's a long answer, but you know, short answer is it depends on the user. Different users have different needs and we are trying to see what are the common themes on those needs. Wonderful. Well, it's, 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 it's amazing to hear. Uh, looking at your biography, you're a <clears throat> technical co-founder, CEO. You, your first company was acquired by Google many, many years ago. And you, you're a developer, I guess, as well. What's it like staying on top of the tech stack you're building? Hardware, software, GPUs, cloud. I imagine you have a lot going on there as well on the back end. Uh, it's super exciting. I guess I often say that this is the best time uh, I got in, in my career. And I remember clearly when when the internet was starting, I remember at university, like the first email the very beginning before the WWW when we had <laughs> Gopher, you know, the, the good old days when the internet was like sprawling, was starting, and it was super exciting. And this is, I think this is even bigger than that. Mm. Okay, it's like the feeling that I get, if you, if you get back to the days of the internet, early internet, it was almost like almost everything that you tried that was new kind of clicked in the user because it was solving a huge problem that was distribution. It was difficult to distribute things, okay? So you had this new shiny hammer that was useful uh, and that, you know, there were so many use cases that were applicable to that. And AI is kind of the same. Like, it's funny, like, how many different things we try and the hit rate is super high. You know, the hit rate of number of things that we tried versus the number of things that click to the user is huge. So I think that we are really at the very beginning of something that will redefine like the next 20, 30 years. Well, I can't wait to um, <clears throat> embark on that journey. And it's, it's exciting times. I agree, the most exciting time in my adult lifetime. And you're doing amazing work onwards and upwards. Congratulations on all the success. Thank you. Thank you. It's a work of a team. Uh, and I, will, I want also to, to say thank you to my team. It's, like uh, around 500 people that have wow. been doing an amazing job. Uh, and I want to highlight that we have been through an amazing transformation. It was not trivial to move from a company that was working on a, in an adjacent domain, like stock images, and that was able to move solidly into Gen AI. And uh, much more movement and uh, transformation ahead. So exciting times. Yeah. Congratulations. Take care. Welcome. Thank you. And th Thank and you. Thanks everyone for listening and watching. Take care.